All right, so we're gonna go right into uh, uh, award ceremony. And I think, I, I think the two judges for, I think we're missing a judge from the Quizix, so we might actually go ahead with another activity. Uh, next, uh, so um, maybe we can start with Fermi questions. Is that okay with you, York? Sure, no problem. Okay, go ahead, you, can, you have a co-host. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I had the pleasure to organize uh, the Fermi questions together with uh, many um, tireless uh, helpers and volunteers. So thanks again to everybody to make this happen. So as you know, Fermi questions have a long history in physics. Uh, they go back to, well, the famous physicist Enrico Fermi depicted here, uh, who suggested that, well, we should, a physicist should be able to come up with quick order of magnitude estimates, back of the envelope type calculations for essentially all kinds of all kinds of things, right? And some of these questions we've asked uh, today, and uh, I have to say that all the teams did a phenomenal job in particularly difficult situations. I know from experience teaching online that everything takes so much longer in these breakout rooms. And I was really impressed how the teams uh, were able to, to handle these questions and the quality of the answers were actually uh, I would say better than we could possibly hope for. So congratulations to everybody. So here is an example of one of the questions that we discussed this morning. Um, uh, suppose we were to start with a sheet of paper um, that's the length of the observer universe and fold in half until this length was smaller than atom of hydrogen. How many folds do you need? Well, so this is something where you need to have some knowledge about yeah, quantities, natural quantities, if you want. You have to have some idea about the size of the universe. Uh, a number that one can uh, come up with is uh, between 10 and 100 billion light years. That has to do with the size of the cosmic microwave background. Um, uh, one also needs to know about the size of the hydrogen atom, uh, 10 to the minus 10 meter, an angstrom is sort of a, a good range to start with. One has to convert that maybe into, into light years. And then one can take the ratio of those two numbers uh, to get 10 to, uh, to the 37. And now uh, the number of folds, well, is you have to do uh, two raised to the nth power uh, to get to the 10 to the 37, you know. Now, how do you solve this? Well, you actually don't really need a calculator for that if you remember some rules about taking logarithms. And then you can find that the number that you get is about 120. You might find that surprisingly low, and this shows you the power of uh, exponential increase uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, is, is uh, appears here in this in this problem. So once again, um, congratulations to everybody working on these uh, problems this morning, and I hope you enjoy thinking about them. So now, without much further ado, here are some results. Uh, for the fifth place, um, uh, we have actually two schools tied: Eric Hamber and Burnaby Mount Secondary. Um, overall, uh, we had a very very tough competition, and we had to look really have carefully at the top uh, who should uh, uh, who should really um, uh, who deserves uh, the, the, the ranking in fourth place SAT education and now the medal positions once again really a very very close competition as it's supposed to be in an Olympics it's basically uh, fractions uh, fractions of a second split seconds uh, that would separate uh, the winners here uh, so third place Burnaby Central second place Burnaby North secondary A and first place, Port Moody Secondary. So congratulations to all these winning teams and to all teams, again, to participating and to the effort that you put in. And thanks again for coming. That's it for my side. Back to Teresa. OK, thank you very much, uh, York. And uh, perfect. So uh, the next we can have, uh, sorry, can we have the circuit activity, Judge? Uh, Josh, please go ahead. Sure. Um, I don't have anything to, to show specifically, but I will give a quick overview of the event and talk about the winners. So uh, the circuit event, uh, the idea was that we provided a bunch of circuits that didn't work quite right in a virtual situation. And the students were, were meant to fix the circuit and then display that it was working correctly. And then the other half of the event, we actually gave them some circuit diagrams or some specific functionality. And then in this virtual circuit environment, they would have to build the circuits and submit those. So it was two halves. And in the, in the first uh, event, the, the team that had the most completed 
tasks had 13 tasks completed of the whatever it was, 19 that we had made. So that was the most that we saw from the, the first half. And the second half, the team that had the most had three. So the second half was definitely a lot harder. So let me just go through uh, the top five. Uh, very similar to what Jorg was talking about. Uh, the top five actually had a top, uh, the, there was a tie for fourth and it was Eric Hamber A and Burnaby Central. And uh, they had each seven correct ones from the first half and two correct ones from the second. Uh, for third place was Mulgrave School with eight from the first half and second or two from the second. Second was the team that had the most correct in the second half and they had three correct in the second half and that was Burnaby North B and they had seven correct in the first half. And then the winner who had the 13 correct in the first half was uh, Semiamu with 13 correct in the first half and two correct in the second half. So. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, there was definitely, it was a bit of a chaotic event in terms of making sure it all worked well, but we weathered the storm and it was pretty awesome in the end. And thank you a thousand times to the volunteers who helped us grade as quickly as humanly possible so that we could actually tell you who those winners were and who did all that hard work making sure that those questions were interesting and challenging. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. And, uh... Uh, the judges are still kind of convening scores for some of the, just confirming some of the uh, scores in for Quizix. So uh, why don't we go ahead with uh, Valerie? Is that okay? Oh, actually, sorry. I have, never mind. I have uh, Alex being ready right now. So why don't we go ahead with the quizzes? Uh, um, uh, yeah. Sorry, quizzes judges. <laughs> I'm stuck. Okay. Uh, just let me share my screen here. That. Okay, yes, so I was helping out with the Quizix, the final Quizix. Um, we had, uh, you know, also, like Joss mentioned, also some challenges in, in running this in terms of tech. And actually, the thing we didn't anticipate is how keen people would be to answer the question immediately. And this sort of broke our, uh, our buzzer system that we'd worked out. Um, but we did the best that we could, and we, we apologize for, for any of the chaos there. Um, but yeah, we had some, some great responses. There we go. Um, very impressed with the, uh, with the level of questions that were being asked and the, and the quality of the answers we were getting. So here's, here's, I'll give you two examples of questions. So here's one. This one um, was a, a Marvel-themed question, and to answer this correctly, uh, you need to understand uh, things about time dilation in, in general relativity. And, and that's a subject that, you know, I, I certainly didn't see until uh, um, undergrad and, and certainly didn't understand until grad school. Um, but uh, we had an immediate correct answer on this. So that, that was very impressive. Um, they could explain why Peter was younger than Zeter using the, the physics of uh, gravitational time dilation. Um, another question that I thought was very challenging, and, and I wasn't sure that anybody would, would get correct, was this one about uh, this box of resistors. Um, there's a, quite a question, quite a, uh, a trick to this, which is to understand how the resistance here scales with the, with the dimension of the box. So if I have an n by n box, uh, you have to realize that a parallel, resistors in parallel have um, one over the number of resistors. So the resistor resistance of, of these guys is, is one of R over three. And then I have three layers. So there's three times R over three. And so you actually got that the resistance was independent of N. And that one was, was challenging. Um, actually, yeah, I didn't think anybody would get it, but we did actually en end up with the right answer. So I was, I was very impressed. And okay, yeah, so th those were the questions. Some of the questions. Uh, I'll now announce the winners. I'll start with third place and then go to second place and, and first place. So the third place team was Eric Hamber secondary A. I think Eric Hamber had two teams. So congratulations, Eric Hamber. The second place team was, drum roll, um, Fraser Heights secondary. Okay. 
Great job, Fraser Heights. And the first place team is bum, 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 Ari Mountain and also Fraser Heights because we actually had a tie uh, for first and second place this year. So great job to both these teams. Fraser Heights, you were not second, you were first. Ari, I was just playing with you. Ari Mountain, you're also first. Um, good job. And uh, yeah. That's, that's funny, team. Alex. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Alex. And I also want to make a note that uh, really quizzes is the biggest challenge we have had because there is a lot of constraint we have with the digital uh, platform. It's not as easy as having a team in the same physical room, raise a card, and then just point at the ping and answer questions. So uh, I just want to thank all the participants for your patience, for kind of getting through it with us and, and kind of working with the judges um, to get to the end of the, the Quizic, final Quizix event. So thank you very much. All right, so the last, um, that last judge we have is the Physics at Home activity. Um, I know that I was really, really impressed by all uh, the country, all the things that uh, the team submitted uh, because I, I was looking at the rule book and I was like, whoa, this is, uh, this is challenging. And then, uh, two pretty much really impressive uh, submissions from the teams. And I know Valerie is going to talk a lot more about it next. So Valerie, go ahead. Thank you, Teresa. It's going to be me, Marina, because Valerie and I, we each one of us were responsible for a different challenge. And because I'm more important, I'm starting with challenge one. It's just a joke. So the challenge that I have, uh, I'll be in charge of reporting, is physics lab at home, challenge one, determining acceleration of free fall. But before moving on, I would like to share with you uh, the picture of a person. Be uh, thanks to him, this became possible. So his name is Sebastian Stocks. He, from, he is from Aachen, Germany. And Sebastian and his team designed the VFOX FIFOX, you can see it's not FIFOX, it's physics, phone, experiments, so it's FIFOX. This is a home lab, so all of us who have smartphones, we can do science using our smartphones. So I'm going to email him personally and say thank you for what he has done. If anybody wants to say thank you to him as his team, go ahead. You even now see where Aachen is in Germany. And now those are the people, so I have to acknowledge I want to acknowledge Andrzej Kotlitsky, who helped us to design it. The idea was Valerie's and myself. So we were very excited to design it, but it would not have happened if not for our amazing volunteer volunteers. Cameron, Sabrina, Valentina, Anya, Anudesh, Lyle, Cecilia, Suhail, Elise, and Tobias. So huge thanks to our amazing volunteers. So quickly, what was the challenge? The challenge was to design an experiment, as many as possible experiments, unique methods to measure acceleration of free fall. So you have to design it using your, and do the measurements using your smartphones. Now, you are not allowed to use any uh, known constants, for example, densities or other constants out of reach. So you have to measure it yourself. So what happened? We had 42 teams in total and 35 of them submitted the, the videos for this challenge. And then each video was judged by at least two people. We have been judging till 1 a.m. To, to this night. By two people, we discussed it. We had a rubric and we discussed based on two main categories. Number one, how many valid methods the students used and B, how the procedure was explained and how accurate the results were. The method would not be valid if you used constants or you used the devices that were outside of FIFOX or you do not do data collection using the FIFOX device. So you can think, how stupid is that? Everybody knows what G, knows what G is. It's so obvious and so easy. So this is a story, I do not know how true it is, about Niels Bohr. So York talked about Enrico Fermi, an Italian. I'm going to Denmark to Niels Bohr, who was asked this question at the physics exam. He was given a barometer and asked to measure the height, to suggest how to measure the height of the building using a barometer. So he suggested lots of lots of ways of doing that. 
one of which was dropping the barometer from the top of the building and, no, and measuring how long it would take for the barometer to fall. So he came up with lots of ideas. And after all, he was a Nobel Prize winner in physics and a lot of high school students would learn about the Bohr atom model in your courses. So something so simple as G is not as simple after all. So when I was, Valerie and I and our volunteers were looking at the videos, we were just stunned by the creativity of the students. For example, who would have thought that a torque wrench and a bucket of water can be used to measure G? Or for example, that you can use for build an airplane. What a thing, build, build a small airplane and look at a circle of motion and measure with the FIFOX and eventually find G based on this activity or a phone oscillating on a spring. And again, record the oscillation and measure G. For example, another one was related to Bernoulli's principle. Although it didn't use VFOX as expected, but the creativity was there. So we were looking at the videos and we were just stunned by the quality. So believe it or not, the students came up with 14 different ways of measuring G. I just couldn't believe it when I looked at the videos. Now, some of them were not valid. For example, if they decided to use the video analysis or external devices, we didn't count it, but still it was very, very creative. For example, there were students who used elastic collisions and they dropped ball and the ball bounced and they, by the recording how long it would take for the ball to bounce and they used the acoustic sen sensor, they could calculate the um, the G. So this was amazing. Even the ones that were discarded because like this video analysis, it's still very, very creative. So um, another thing I wanted to mention before the result that uh, we noticed that some, some teams reported the uncertainties in a very creative way, in a very precise way. Some teams wrote that they were uncertain about the, how to report uncertainties, which was I think nice, but I and other teams, even though they would measure using regular rulers, they were able to report the value of G to uh, eight or nine significant digits. And I just recently read a paper in Science from 2018 that they recorded uh, the capital G, the gravitational universal gravitational constant, to this many digits, and it was reported in Science. It was a big deal. So I would like mention to mention that uh, sometimes the students are a little bit exaggerated the precision of their um, experiments, but a lot of times they did an amazing job. So now here is the res here are the results, and I couldn't find the sound on the internet, so you have to create the sound. So in the tenth tenth place, Burnaby North, they got thirteen points, point three point Gray secondary. Sentinel secondary, Eric Hamber secondary. Thank you, Teresa, thank you. Said education. Now I'm going to move to the top five schools and you can see how, school, how close the results are. Fleetwood Park secondary, five methods, five distinct methods that were legitimate. RE Mountain secondary, also five methods but the explanations were more accurate. Burnaby North, seven distinct methods to measure G using the FIFOX. Richmond Secondary School, 25 points, eight distinct methods. And are you excited to know how many methods were the winning school result? Do you want to know or should I just stop it? <laughs> no? Okay. Simiamo Secondary, 14 different methods to determine the, believe it or not, to determine the acceleration of free fall. So congratulations to all, huge thanks to all the judges and to all of you. I think I was so proud to see so many of my former students who are now teachers and all the people who studied physics with you guys and became teachers. Thank you all for doing that because VFOX is an amazing, amazing tool that we can all use to do physics, not only to learn about it theoretically, but to do it. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Marina. Uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, at home project. Uh, go ahead, Valerie.
Am I sharing now or not yet? No. no. Oh. Yeah, you're, uh, oops. Am I sharing? You share. No, I'm, sh I'm sharing my screen, correct? Yes. Yeah, you are. Okay, hi, <laughs> hi everybody. Sorry. Um, so, um, second uh, challenge of this physics hub, uh, physics lab at home, uh, was determining the speed of sound at zero degrees centigrade. Uh, again, using FIFOX uh, physics um, app, as Marina just described. And I want to uh, also echo uh, Marina's comments that uh, as as a as a faculty and experimental physicist uh, here at UBC, I was absolutely blown away by the creativity and, and the quality of experimental work that uh, the students, the schools uh, pulled off. It's, um, it's just unbelievable, given that um, all their experiments were, were done with, uh, with a smartphone. Uh, I think many of us here uh, at UBC uh, physics and astronomy department would have been proud of our graduate students if they pulled, if they, if they, um, uh, carried out experiments at that level. So that was really astonishing to see uh, and very inspiring to see uh, so many creative and enthusiastic students in our schools doing unbelievable things uh, when they, you know, uh, put to challenge. Uh, as uh, uh, Marina was saying, um, I also want to um, acknowledge our volunteers. So for the physics, uh, for the FIFOX challenge, we had 19 volunteers who stuck with us till the very end. And I cannot thank them enough for uh, spending, uh, for doing the hard work. Um, I actually estimated right now as a Fermi, as a very simple Fermi question that every one of them probably put in anywhere between 20 and 50 hours of work. I, I kid you not. Um, we had more than 10 meetings, et cetera. So in, in a second challenge, the team of nine was Timothy, Cara, Daniela, Belinda, Brittany, Angela, Mike, Nia, and Andrew. Thank you guys if you are on this uh, webinar, but um, uh, you were incredibly helpful and we could not have done it without you. Absolutely not because of the amount of work that need, needed to be done. Okay, to the challenge itself. So the idea was to ask students to measure speed of sound. FIFOX actually shows how to do that. And so to make it a bit spicier, we asked to do it, uh, we, we added two challenges into this main uh, task. First, you had to do it at zero degrees centigrade, so speed of sound in air is at, at zero, and you, could and you were not allowed to use any other devices, including rulers, scales, um, watches, uh, timers, nothing, just your, your uh, smartphone. There were fewer methods here than 14 that Semi Amo came up with G because the, the task was harder. Uh, nevertheless, I listed here six and I will go right away and show you. So the first couple were kind of uh, um, straightforward. Uh, they required some careful work, but it was just uh, to measure the propagation of sound waves in free space between two uh, smartphones. Uh, we did allow you uh, the use of, of multiple smartphones. So that was, uh, that was a legitimate approach. So here's a, a picture with some uh, creative use of uh, um, uh, drums for or whatever that is to, to uh, emit uh, loud sound and, and measure that. Uh, echo or the, uh, the famous sonar uh, approach was used very often by many schools where you uh, actually measure the, uh, with a single smartphone, you measure the reflection from a wall. You have to be uh, uh, quite uh, accurate here. As you see there, there's uh, uh, some blankets there because the reflections come out come from every single dire direction. So if you're not careful, you're not going to measure properly the distance to that wall, etc. Uh, Doppler effect, where the frequency of sound changes, uh, uh, dependent of course on the on the velocity of the uh, emitter, but also on the speed of sound in the media, the medium that it propagates through. Uh, that's one of those challenge of those approaches uh, where calculations, some actually some uh, quite involved calculations with calculus and and uh, and derivatives were were needed. And so I'm just showing it here. And of course, the implementation, experimental implementation, involved all sort of uh, remotely controlled cars with uh, iPhones attached to them, uh, running towards each other and hitting each other, etc. Wave interference was the next level, which we, we we considered as a very creative approach. And that's, you can see here, two um, speakers emitting the same sound uh, driven by the, by the smartphone, by the FIFOX application. Now, this is one of the experiments 
that I try always to show in our physics 101 classes. And I know how hard it is to, to show the maxima and minima of the interference pattern. And I was absolutely stunned that, but that, that the one of the schools uh, or, or a couple of schools pulled it off and they measured the interference fringes. Um, uh, that is the interference of those two waves uh, with the smartphone again and uh, determine the speed of, uh, determine the wavelength and, and uh, from that, the speed of light, the uh, speed of sound, sorry. Uh, standing waves was, I think, the, fa the, la the last approach which many many students uh, uh, tried. So uh, standing waves in air columns will will uh, give you also resonant frequencies or resonant wavelengths, which will depend on uh, the, um, the speed of light in that medium. So there was a lot of uh, ingenuity here in how to gradually change the length of the air column. So here you see it's submerged in water, and then you can gradually move it in and out. Uh, one school actually went as far as to to uh, to make uh, a kunst tube uh, work, where you put um, baby powder inside, you drive it with your FIFOX application again, and that gives you a standing pattern inside, which is quite amazing. Again, we have this demo in our physics demonstration room, and it's not easy to make it work. Uh, again, very surprised. Um, and um, if you uncork a wine bottle, it turns out. Uh, you know, we do it very often. You uncork a wine bottle. If you use a spectrum analyzer, which FIFOX has, you can see uh, on, the, on it immediately the spectrum of, of sound from the wine bottle. And those are the harmonics. And considering the, the wine bottle uh, a, 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 an air column, you can again calculate the speed of sound right there. So that was very inventive. Now, those are the methods. I want to quickly show something else. So there were two challenges, sub-challenges in this task, which turned out to be a really key. One was that rulers were not available and you needed to measure distance. So they, the students had to create their own rulers, okay? So a free fall, a pendulum. So here's a free fall, uh, here's a pendulum uh, were used. Uh, and it's nice because they could, the students could use their experience from task one that Marina described to measure the length. And that was used by most of the teams very nicely. So that was nice. One team got a, a bit sneaky and they decided since we don't allow them to use and, and uh, a ruler, they will make their own by just taking a known ruler and copying it on a piece of paper. So we caught it, we caught it, you know, this shows that we were careful, we caught and it didn't allow that to happen. Even more tricky was the thermometer. So notice that we asked, it, it was asked to measure the speed of sound at zero C, but you couldn't have the thermometer. What do you do? You need to somehow calibrate your temperature. So a, a whole bunch of approaches were here. I don't have time to, to go over it, but the main one was, I used the ideal gas law, okay, with a few different angles to it. You use thermal expansion of a gas, of air, for example. Um, a team or two built a bimetallic strip, which is almost a, a, a perfect uh, thermometer used in, in real research labs sometimes. So here are examples. For example, here's a, an iPhone submerged in ice cold water to calibrate, the, to measure the pressure because a FIFOX has a pressure, well, any smartphone has a pressure detector. And so using FIFOX, you could measure pressure inside and knowing that the temperature here at zero degrees, you can then uh, calibrate the temperature in the, in the, in the room and, and you, you will know what it is. So the, the challenge was to know, not to do necessarily the experiment at zero, but to do it at known temperature and then scale it back to zero theoretically. Um, here is uh, some chemistry involved. Turns out that you can also use uh, a, a, a ideal gas law if you, but then uh, if, if you need to know the molar mass or the molar quantity of a gas, one team uh, used chemistry, their knowledge in chemistry and created a known quantity of, uh, of gas by, 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 by running a chemical reaction with a, with a baking soda. And then they had to use Archimedes principle to determine the volume and voila, from that, they got the temperature as well. Uh, here is a, uh, an exp a thermal expansion at work where people, uh, one, one school used uh, an ampule, a sealed ampule with some color, either oil or water, I don't remember now, and they could calibrate it and now know whenever they could wait outside until this, the temperature hits zero and then, and then perform the experiment. Here is the, uh, the bimetallic strip with a conveniently attached chopstick to measure temperature very, 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 very precisely. Uh, our favorite method, our favorite method, I kid you not, uh, is based, is based, I learned it uh, last night, is based on so-called Dolbier's law. I didn't know 
that um, this could not be, I could not make it up, right? I'm, I'm reading it from, from Wikipedia. Dolbeer's law states the relationship between the air temperature and the air at which crickets chirp. It was formulated by Amos Dolbeer and published in 1897 in an article called The Cricket as a Thermometer. So apparently, apparently a theoretical cricket will chirp minus 30 times per minute at zero centigrade. So minus 30 times is not very convenient. So that means that the cricket is dead by that point. Uh, but they, the, the, the team uh, very creatively wanted to, wanted to take a shot at it and they tried it. And uh, I have to make a disclaimer that no crickets were harmed during this experiment. Um, I think that's it from me and uh, the winners are, uh, and the fifth place is Burnaby North with 12 points. Fourth place is Sammy Amu with 12.3. Third is Richmond with 14. Eric Hamber B is 15 points, and that's the second. And in the first place is Ari Mountain with almost 20 points and very many of those uh, uh, methods implemented. Thank you very, very much. All right. Thank you so much, Valerie. And uh, uh, before I go to the next part, uh, I just want to say, say that, you know, everyone can have seen all the, all the activities hmm? and <laughs> I'm gonna mute some people. Uh, <laughs> but it's all really good activities, and and it takes a lot of effort to put them together. So, uh, the volunteers' contributions, as well as the judges, uh, some some of them are working last night, the night before, meeting every week, and doing regular interactions with uh, our volunteers on Slack to make sure that the activities happen. Um, so I want to take the chance to thank everybody, and I'm going to give the next part to uh, our Physics Olympics chairs. Aaron, Mike? Hi, thank you, Teresa, and thank you to everyone for participating in this 41 and a half Physics Olympics. We specifically called it 41 and a half because we wanted to emphasize that we know it's peculiar, that this isn't the way that it's going to continue being. And we're going to have then the 42nd Olympics next year when we can meet all together in person. And, 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 and it has nothing to do with the fact that we have a bunch of t-shirts that we would like to use next year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, see, now, see, we did it. That, that may not have been so obvious. Now, now people are going to wonder. But no, it had nothing to do with that at all, at all. No, we... We thank everyone for participating and we did our best to, um, to try to accommodate the circumstances while understanding all the tremendous pressure that people are under right now. And we do hope that we maintained at least the spirit of Physics Olympics and that you had fun in the process, that you learned a lot. You heard from all the judges so far that we've learned a lot in this process. We know it wasn't perfect, but we, we do hope that everyone had a great time. It was a great learning experience. Uh, this took a lot of time. You've heard that for people to pull off. So I once want to thank once again, all of the teachers, all of the parents, all of the students for participating. And of course, all the judges and the volunteers who took part in this year's Physics Olympics. So thank you again, big round of applause here. I want to particularly thank Teresa, who has done so much for this Physics Olympics. You don't have no idea how much. I'm not sure I have a full idea of how much. She's done so much for this Physics Olympics. And the same goes for Marina. Marina, thank you so much for everything that you've done for this Physics Olympics. So Teresa has done so much for the online. Marina has been a liaison with all the teachers. And without those two, we would not be able to have this Physics Olympics. Thank you both. Now, what I have here is this box of chocolate. Okay, so I'm gonna have one and I'm gonna go ahead and give it over to uh, Marina first there. And now, and so now it's being transported through cyberspace and going to Marina. Now I have another one here, okay? And now I'm gonna give this to <laughs> Teresa. Okay, here you go, Teresa. All right, there you go. So now I've given it to Teresa and it's going through cyberspace. And hopefully one of them get it pretty quick. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So one of the things um, I don't, I don't think, oh, I don't. 
we're, the, the teleportation part hasn't really worked out, hey? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working on this right now um, at, um, within the okay. physics department. Uh, there, it's still, it's still uh, you know, in process, uh, but hopefully things are going to come through with it pretty soon where we'll be able to conserve the property of things that we transport. <laughs> we're just focusing on food right now. Uh, okay. So, with... <laughs> all right. There... There's a little bit of time and space dilation taking place there. <laughs> uh, before we move on to uh, announce the overall winners, I want to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. Mike, do you have anything you would like to add? Well, I would just like to second what you said about Teresa and Marina, and especially Teresa, I, I, I'm maintaining the website for my course, as I think most faculty members are doing. And I've run into so many hooks and crannies and pitfalls with Canvas and Zoom. Uh, and, and so I think I've discovered most of them. The IT people tell me I'm one of their best customers uh, for finding things that nobody else has found, because we're dealing with a thousand students in three different sections and trying to keep everything going. So Teresa, let me just say, I think you've done a fabulous job. Um, I, I can't imagine that, that it worked as well as it did. I was expecting a lot more. And by the way, Valerie was worried about people's computers dying during the, the Zoom sessions and during the event today. I actually had an hour and a half power failure last yesterday. I don't know if everybody else out at UBC did because of the tree falling down on the line, but uh, it, everything worked very well today. So, so thank you to everybody. On and I just wanted to say that some of the events we all have learned, maybe we will use somewhat what we have learned in the future. I think the home lab challenge with FIFOX was just fantastic. So maybe what we have done this year is something that we can partially incorporate even when we come back to campus. I agree. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the overall rankings. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and announce the top five. The we're gonna start right now in fifth place with a decibel score of interestingly 42.0 is, I'm gonna post it in the chat window. There we go, Fraser Heights Secondary. Number four, once again in the chat window with a score, decibel score of 40.3. Remember the lower the decibel score, the higher the ranking. Number four, Port Moody Secondary. Sorry for the typo. All right. Now for the medalists. In third place with a decibel score of 32.0, we have Semiamu Secondary. Congratulations. With a decibel score of 31.0, the silver medalist. We have Burnaby North Secondary. Congratulations, Burnaby North. That's B team. B, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And the gold medalist, the winner of the 41 and a half Physics Olympics. Drum roll. RE Mountain Secondary with a decibel score of 25.3. Congratulations. Once again, thank you to everyone who participated this year. Great job to all of the students. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend. Any last words from the rest of the judges? Well, um, we will, we will. Congratulations, everyone. And uh, hope to see some of you come back to be volunteers of the event. And we will hopefully see you in person next year. And thanks to Aaron for his work on the spreadsheet. I know it's such a terrific job that has to be done every year. And, and it's also a pressure cooker to get it done on time. So uh, thanks to all of the judges for the, each of the events for getting their scores in to, to Aaron. And thanks to Aaron for, for getting it done so quickly uh, that we didn't have to fill all of the time.
Thank you, everyone. Else. That, that, that would be that, that would be the end of our session. So thank you.